Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show. Joining us as always when I'm not gold bricking, the prince of Twitter, <laughs> the regent of redstate.com, Andrew Malcolm at AH Malcolm on the Twitters is, and of course over at redstate.com where he's a VIP columnist and sometimes he's got his stuff out in the clear too. Um, yeah. Andrew, uh, welcome, uh, welcome back. Or maybe I well, should say- Well, welcome you. Yeah, that's a welcome back to you. You're the guy that's been traveling. I'm the guy that's been gold bricking. I've been gold bricking the whole time. So there you go. Um, you know, um, I want to, um, I, I want to ask you, um, um, what you think, uh, I'm sorry, I started something here and I started a timer app there and it just, it, it did weird things. So I'm going to stop, I'm going to stop that timer app and go back to the topic, just wing it like I usually do. Um, <laughs> uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, your columns. You've got a couple of great columns up in, in the time that I have been gone. Um, you notice that there was movement in the race and, and I'd say that if you're looking at the betting markets, more than a little movement. Um, and then you're also talking about the Biden's revenge on Kamala Harris. Um, yeah. which one is that first? <laughs> That's delicious. <laughs> it's awesome. It was a great column, too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, there's been several things which you, some of which you could attribute to, uh, you know, Biden not being there. 100%, but uh, not all of them. And, uh, you know, he, 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 uh, Kamala came out and said, oh, you know, that DeSantis, he's screwing things up in the hurricane. And then they asked Biden about it. And he said, no, he's actually quite good. He's been doing a great job, very cooperative and so on. So you got that, which was kind of blunt. Um, and um, she's, she is, she, who was it? Oh, it was in The Godfather, right? When he's talking to Andy Garcia and he says, okay, you are who you are. Yes. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I forgot that line. That's a good line. You know. Yeah. Uh, the other, my other line that, that I like is uh, Joey Zaza Zapazzo. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. Uh, you you are who you are, and that's that's who she is. Um, Biden said that she was there with him one hundred percent all the way, involved in all the major decisions. And the View asked her, "Well, you know, what what would you do have done differently?" And she said, "I can't think of anything." So, you know, it's yeah. it's pretty klutzy. Um, and we know that Jill um, despises Kamala for uh, some of the things that Kamala said about her, her husband back in 2020, racist and so on. Um, and um, they stuck her with the Biden campaign organization. They tacked on a few other people of hers. But uh, so... <laughs> His <laughs> revenge is sweet, right? I mean, it's uh, and what I tried to point out, and uh, I won't talk about everything, but what I tried to point out is that Kamala Harris is a problem. Now, there none of those Democrats are going to admit it, uh, but she was uh, uh, <laughs> the only choice they could make if they didn't want to have a racial backlash when they replace Biden. Uh, but truth is, they really don't want her around. So if they talk, by golly, we got to get her in the White House, but she loses, hey, well, okay, Americans have decided. And um, that kind of eliminates her from the 2028 picture, which is fine with Gavin Newsom and all the other wannabes. Right. Um, and Biden then can go out and say, well, look, you know, I, I could have beaten him, uh, which he's a mean man and he's very defensive. So that would serve his purpose. So and there's a bunch of other stuff that I went into, but uh, it just makes sense 
I mean, if she wins, she wins and somebody will tell her what to do all the time, like they're telling Joe Biden what to do. But if she goes away, it's uh, they'll, they'll, the media will still have Trump to beat up on and the Democrats will have Trump to beat up on. And um, he'll still inhabit their mind if he wins. So um, I yeah. thought that was I thought that was kind of fun. And judging by the numbers, it, it, a lot of other people were interested in it, too. So, yeah, what I would say is this, too, is that the revenge isn't really specific to Kamala Harris. It's specific to Nancy Pelosi, Barack Obama, Chuck Schumer, right. the people who pushed them out of the race. I don't think, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I hear that Jill Biden and Kamala Harris don't get along. I don't know how true that is. But I think his ire is yeah. not with Kamala yeah. Harris. It's with the people who pushed him out of the race. The establishment. And he, stuck yeah. with, he stuck them with her as a yeah. way to as a way to get even with them. And that I can buy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It I mean it human nature life would be so simple if we didn't have to deal with other people. But since we do, uh the little dramas that play out and the humanity, these people sometimes look like robots, but they're not. They're as petty as um, uh, the secretary at a PTA meeting. <laughs> well, and, and I mean, we already knew that Kamala Harris wasn't really good at this, right? We learned that in 2019. Yeah. Right. So this is kind of getting into, uh, you know, some of the other things that we're talking about, including the, the movement in the remarkably close race, some of which I covered earlier today in terms of what the betting markets are showing, which it really swung pretty significantly over the last few days to Donald Trump, largely in reaction to Kamala Harris's media blitz, which didn't go well, <laughs> Andrew. Bananas or raspberries or whatever. Oh my gosh, did not go well. Um, now the most prominent of these is an interesting story, not just in terms of the, the the electoral cycle, which it still is for that, but in terms of media corruption. And I think we're at the level of media corruption here. Uh, CBS News uh, got an interview with her on, for their 60 Minutes program, important enough to where they actually aired it on a Monday night, right? Yeah. Uh, and... Um, Donald Trump refused to do an interview with 60 Minutes because he felt that they had sandbagged him yeah. uh, four years and right, ago. And, and rightly, rightly so. so. Rightly so. They, and they never apologized for it. They never corrected the record on it. And he says, well, until you apologize and correct the record, I'm not going to sit down and do an interview with you guys. Fair enough. Um, so Harris gets the sit down interview with Bill Whitaker, I believe, uh, is, the, is the reporter's yeah. And they start releasing clips over the weekend. This is before I actually left on my trip, right? So I'm watching these clips, a couple of them, right? And they're word salads, right? <laughs> she doesn't answer the question. She doesn't even come close to answering her question in these word salad responses. I didn't, you know, I was traveling. I didn't watch the actual 60 Minutes broadcast. But what happened was <laughs> 60 Minutes went back after they released the excerpts, right, to promote the interview. They went back and changed the answer on one of these to something else that she'd said in response to a different question. And the only reason we know that is because they'd actually released it yeah, yeah. in a promo. Now, I get that sit-down interviews get edited. I, I do. I get it happens all the time unless you're unless you're doing it live they get edited and and because there's all sorts of different things you got two camera shots you want to cut in the, the questioner and the, i totally get it but i've never ever 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 heard of a legitimate news outlet cutting an answer given by a political candidate and pasting in one to make that candidate look better. Now, Andrew, you've been around the news industry an awfully yeah. long time. Have you ever even heard of somebody doing no. that? No, no, not at all. There are games that go on um, and interviews that are allegedly exclusive, 
but they're used as rehearsal for the politicians. So they give you an exclusive interview at noon and then they go do a news conference at five and they've had four hours to figure out what the media is likely to ask. I mean, there are those things that go on and it's, I, I don't know if it's fair or not, but it, it's understandable. But cheating and, and, and slipping in something that in the place where she didn't say it, that's just, no, it's unethical. And, it, you know, it fits with, remember the Dan Rather business going after George W. Bush? Sure. That uh, turned out to be false. It fits with an attitude of helping one side and not the other, or trying to help. And it's strange because back when I started uh, in national corresponding back in the late 60s and early 70s, CBS was the gold standard. I mean, those people were, were even amongst television, they were real pros. They were doing stuff, uh, getting into places that nobody else could get into, um, and, you know, fair coverage. Of course, those were the Walter Cronkite days. But... Um, but the the culture of these places and of the whole profession has just changed radically since the uh, I'd say the Bill Clinton days, uh, and it's it's pathetic. It's like you said, it's corrupt. Um, it's sad, but more importantly, it's it's bad for democracy. We need <clears throat> in our democracy, we need a fair media. They're no longer fair. They got constitutional protections to uh, to be the government watchdog, and they're only the watchdog on one party. And it's um, it's crushing. And I don't know until you get somebody like J.D. Vance who's prepared to talk back to them with harsh honesty boy did you see what he did to martha raddatz i did and look i mean i was traveling on sunday right when i got back home i think i may have even been on the plane or at the airport i looked yeah. at, i looked at the um I, I looked at that and i played the clip and it yeah. was like now that's how it's done i know there was a lot of people who were questioning whether or not jd vance was a wise choice because it was Kind of no, that, that, yeah, that that convinced me. I've I've not been a big fan. I've not been an opponent or anything, but uh, I've I've not been impressed with JD. But that that comeback to Martha Radish, she said, well, he was criticizing the cross border uh, crime waves, and she said, well, in the Aurora, Aurora, Colorado, and she said, well, that happened in only a few apartment complexes. <laughs> this is from the woman who lives in a two and a quarter million dollar private home in Arlington. It's only a few thousand people getting robbed and mugged. <laughs> and JD, and he came right back and said, are you listening to yourself? Or do you hear yourself? Uh, these people come in from the open border that Kamala Harris was supposed to fix. Uh, and uh, Donald Trump is the problem. It, it, it the beauty of it was it was so clear and so concise. He didn't go on. There weren't a lot of uh, clauses and and then on the other hand, but if you're fair, right, there wasn't a lot of that stuff. It was just straight to the point, and I thought devastating. Now the the truth is that not that many people are watching Sunday morning shows anymore, um, but we've got some. We've and I actually I wrote a post a couple of weeks ago. I think we talked about it here. Uh, yeah. That there's a whole new generation of uh, Republican surrogates coming up. Tom Cotton has been the primary one. Uh, he's just he's devastating uh, on on news media, and he you know not at all intimidated. And now JD, who was picked to be tough, um, is tough. Um, there are others, um, but I'm hoping that uh, a whole bunch of others, even the old timers, will get emboldened by the effectiveness of these um, tough comebacks. Uh, and the beauty is they're not partisan comebacks. They're, they're pointing out the facts. Devastating for media like Martha Reddit's.
You know, I, I'll tell you what ran through my mind when I was watching that was the um, uh, the the old joke about um, about a guy who's been uh, accused of being unfaithful to his wife, and he says, "Unfaithful? I'll have you know that I've been faithful to her dozens of times." Um, <laughs> Yeah. I guess that qualifies as a joke of the week, by the way. I, it's an yeah, old joke. Okay. It's a, a pre premature jocularity. <laughs> <laughs> I think we might have found a new, I, we might have found a whole new class of sponsors for this podcast. That's right. That's <laughs> right. It's that's... From premature jocularity. <laughs> <laughs> P -J, P, uh, PJ. Instead of ED, it's PJ. Um, PJ, yeah, yeah, sorry. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> that's a good one. I got you on that one. That's it, a, you, you totally got me on that one. That was awesome. Um, <laughs> but, yes, I mean, this is a guy who can actually answer questions in context, right? And in substance, you, yeah. In substance. And, and, look, Raditz was asking him tough questions. That's okay. She was asking a stupid question in that particular case. That was a dumb thing to say, but she was actually asking him tough questions and he can respond to that. You know, I also saw while I was on vacation, um, or maybe it was even yesterday, um, he had done an interview with Martha McCallum and it was not a, it was not a softball interview. She was kind of trying to pin him down on policy, uh, talk about, how he differed from Trump in the past and that sort of thing. And, you know, and he's clearly he's prepared to do this. He's prepared to talk. Uh, his big thing today, though, of course, J.D. Vance's mm -hmm. thing today is Kamala Harris's book apparently was plagiarized from Wikipedia in some significant part. And he's tweeting out, um, you know, I wrote my own book. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, he's, well, you know, he's, it runs in it not. runs in the administration, and Joe Biden got in trouble for plagiarizing. Yeah, you know, back when they picked picked her, I mean, people weren't checking her book out for that type of thing. But some, I think it was Christopher Rufo, ran it through the you know, the plagio meter. I guess there's there's some software that will actually scour the internet to see if you know books or essays are plagiarized, and. Apparently, he must have used that and come up with a bunch of examples of how exactly they were being played, you know, how exactly she had filled in her book, uh, partly from Wikipedia, partly from other sources without attribution. And um, so that's the story today. But I mean, this is part of the problem over two weeks, over the last couple of weeks. For some reason, and I know what the reason was, they decided that they needed to do sort of a media blitz kind of right i think they needed to be seen to be doing a media blitz she still hasn't done a press conference no um and up until today <laughs> she was doing soft media with the exception of 60 minutes and that blew up in her face right even though bill whitaker and the 60 minutes editing team did everything they could to try to make her look as good as possible she went on the view i think you've already mentioned this talking about how well i wouldn't have done anything different over the last four years oh and by the way i'm the change candidate um yeah and uh, the univision interview that she did oh the, now, the forum yeah 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 that's so up. she did it so so she did it now it looked like a town hall okay and the announcer was there on the right she's there on center stage the audience is up in a tier like a late night show and if you watch the video there's a teleprompter about this big in front of her mm -hmm. <clears throat> that the audience can't see. And as the camera goes around her back, you see the teleprompter moving and then it goes dark because the producers realize they're showing their, the, the, the trick. Now, the announcer or the host Later, so when then people asked him about that, he said, oh, that was for my introduction. Yeah. Well, then one, why'd you turn it off? Right. And two, why is it still on? And if you 
when the introduction is long gone. And three, if you look at it, you can't read it, but if you look at it, there's text. It's not a, it's not, oh, he said his excuse was that after his introduction, it became a timer. Well, if you look at it, when the camera's moving behind her, you see there's no timer. It's a text. It's a moving text, giving her answers um, for the questions allegedly spontaneous coming from the audience. You know, it's phony, and I don't know if it matters in the long run, but it adds uh, evidence that accumulates. And if you're hurt, if you're if you have a reputation for something like plagiarizing, and then there's another plagiarizing, that makes it worse. If a politician has a reputation for lying, and then he's caught in another lie, that makes it worse because it, it reinforces the uh, it reinforces the impression. Hillary Clinton got caught back in 2008 at an Iowa town hall, uh, planting questions with the audience. And turns out, I think it was CNN too, it turns out that uh, her advanced people went to the audience and said, was anybody gonna ask questions? And this college girl raised her hand and they said, what are you gonna ask? And she stated her question. And the guy said, well, how about if you ask this? Because it would appeal to a strength of, of Hurley Quinn's. So she did. But then she went outside and told reporters later that they, had, that they had her ask that question. That's the kind of games that go on. And of course, Hillary was well prepared for that question. That's well, why they're and, planning it. Yeah. In this particular case, they actually had, they were actually saying, well, these are all undecided voters. Mm -hmm. you know, undecided Hispanic voters. And it turned out that they weren't. They were all Kamala Harris supporters. Half of them were, were, were recruited by Harris's campaign. The other half were recruited by uh, a, uh, it's called Fan on Q um, service that put out basically a casting call uh, for Kamala Harris supporters. The, the Harris campaign bust half of them in this Fan on Q um company got the rest of them in there because there weren't enough volunteer supporters who wanted to come in and talk to her actually talk to her talk or, or at her. yeah but i mean but they miss but uh, again Univision totally misrepresented. misrepresented yeah yeah and uh michael tracy who's a um he's actually a sort of a progressive journalist but he's sour <laughs> on on democrats at the moment for good reasons um was there and he was trying to interview you know, members of the audience, and he got to talk to a couple of them. They said, "Oh no, we're not undecided. We're they sent us up here because we support Kamala Harris." Yeah, yeah, uh, and that's after he talked to a few of them. The producers shut down his access to the audience, and he found out Michael. Who? Who is that? Michael Tracy. He's on. I, I forget where he's at. He's on Twitter all the time. Hmm. You should know him because you're the prince of Twitter. Right? That's true. That's true. But. Not, I don't let everyone into the castle. There you go. <laughs> all right. But all of this is sort of a ramp up to well, something we mentioned earlier, which is that Kamala Harris has now agreed to do a one on one interview. And I've been calling it nearly live with Brett Baer on Fox News. And nearly I know live. that. I know that Democrats are going to say, well, this is because she's courageous. And the New York Times was covering the, well, she can reach different voters and she can reach on MSNBC and CNN. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. certainly true. <laughs> but there is no way in hell that she does this unless she thinks she's losing. Yeah. And she refused to do a debate on Fox. Uh, I think Brett Baer had offered this interview opportunity uh, in August, and and they refused it, yeah. and uh, and suddenly, it's on like Donkey Kong, and I guess they, <laughs> you know, Brett Bear is, I would say, a fair and professional journalist. He's going to ask questions. He's going to treat her with respect, but he's going to ask questions, and he's going to drill down to get the answers, and. Um, at least that's my and that's my yeah interview. no i think so i think yeah i think so uh, obviously and 
<coughs> excuse me, if I was him, um, she has dodged full answers several times. I mean, even Whitaker asked her repeatedly questions that she was dodging. And if I was him, at some point, after two or three efforts, I would say, well, obviously, you're not going to answer that real question and move on. Uh, just to underline the point that there's, I'm not sure that everyone, probably a lot of people, but I'm not sure that everyone will get if she's just talking her word salads that sound swell, unless you're thinking of what the words mean. I'm not sure everyone would get the fact that dodge, dodge, dodge. Yeah, you know, again, look, I mean, I think if she dodges, he's probably going to ask a follow-up. And if she dodges that, then it might be a Dana Bash sort of thing where he just decides he's going to move on to the next topic. No, you got to call it out, I think. I think you got it. I would, but I respect Brett Bear, but I hope he does. Um, but I respect I Brett Bear, too. I think he's fair. Yeah, yeah, he is fair, and I think and, he has a Brit Hume. I think he's got a Brit Hume sense of approach to his job, and Brit Hume would certainly follow up and press for an answer. Um, I just got to ask you, what do you think is going on in their minds? Because the only thing I can think of is that they're going to try to use whatever she does as some sort of way of saying that fox news it's fox news's problem fox news is misogynistic fox news is whatever racist whatever because i can't imagine her coming out of that looking good she couldn't even do that in 60 minutes in the view <laughs> yeah, that's true yeah uh, yeah you're absolutely true and those were softball in the view especially yeah. um well i think that's fox news strength it's, you know it, it it came in in what was the late 90s i think and it provides things that others don't, and it gets labeled by the Democrats as conservative. But the fact is, I think the last numbers I saw, a third of the Fox special report audience is uh, our Democrats. Uh, and it's because it's a different tack on the news. And uh, personally, I, I watch them all the time. I, I haven't caught them in any of this... Um, tape editing, distorting uh, type of business. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's just shameful. Uh, but it's a younger generation that wasn't raised. They weren't apprentices. They were moved right along into prominent jobs. Not Brett Baer, not Martha McCallum, not Brit Hume. But uh, you know, Brit Hume and I have, have identical birthday on the identical year. So okay. I okay. I have yeah I have to respect I've never found anybody else like that but I have to respect him. <laughs> there were a couple of Hollywood actors I think that had my same birth date and year. I feel really? bad for them now, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> forget who they are too. I'd have to go look it up. But uh, yeah, the uh, I mean, you'd have to be desperate if you're Kamala Harris to do this with Brett Bear. You, You'd think so, I, but now now here's the thing. I agree with you 100% that that's the reason for her, but Brett, um, Donald Trump went into the South Bronx. That's enemy territory, you know? He went into the Black Journalists Association. Now, he fell into a fight that he didn't really need, yeah. um, so I, he didn't handle that too well, I thought, but... Uh, but he's gone into places where you think a Republican is not always welcome. And that is bravery. And the, what I learned in my, whatever it was, 10 years in politics was um, you have to ask for the vote. I mean, sometimes literally, you, you know, in a town hall, you're explaining things and you say, and that's why I'm here to ask for your vote. Americans like that. They like straight shooters well, at least appearance of straight shooting, um, and that they're there to hear from them. And you, that's not what you get from, from Kamala Harris. These are, these are set up, set ups. Um, she, you know, she's been in Washington, uh, even political did a deep dive on this. Uh, Harris has spent 
half the time since the convention in Washington. So she's not out and she may do one or two, you know, drop by an ice cream shop or something, but uh, she's not out meeting real people. These are staged places. Uh, and right. uh, um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's sad, but it's revealing at the same time. But, you know, you won't find the media harping on it, as I think they should, uh, uh, the way they harp on Trump about his foibles. Um, I just hope that in the long run, and boy, has this been a long run, right? This is the longest presidential, <laughs> this is the longest presidential campaign in, in American history, uh, that in the long run, uh, Americans will figure it out. My dad always said that. In the end, American voters figure it out. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I don't have that confidence anymore. Uh, but I. But I. But I. But I hope they do. There certainly is ample evidence. Uh, and you know, Trump. Trump. Uh, Trump fans. Trump's base and Kamala's base. They're not going to catch on to anything other than what they want to believe. But. The people who matter, which is the the bulge in the middle, I hope they uh, I hope they figure it out and realize that they're not voting for a prom queen, they're voting for a commander in chief, uh, who's going to at some point probably have to ask volunteers in the military to put themselves in harm's way, and I, I, a word salad would not be very convincing for t troops. All right. One last, one last quick thing from last week, because I, I wasn't around when this thing dropped, but it has been roundly uh, ridiculed, which was the Men for Harris ad, <laughs> which I honestly thought was something from the Babylon Bee when I heard <laughs> thought. Did you see this thing? No. Well, oh, I, heard, I heard about it. So I'm just going to read you a couple of paragraphs of Matt Taibbi, <laughs> who's, who basically sums this up about as brilliantly as you can possibly imagine. It says, there are so many fakes and parodies on the internet that I had to approach man enough and add ostensibly targeting male voters for Kamala Harris, Tim Waltz campaign on mental tiptoe. I heard the premise before watching and was certain it had to be a meta prank of the Andy Kaufman school. Nobody could be that stupid. It's no <laughs> prank. Written and directed by Jimmy Kimmel writer and Jacob of All Trades Substack contributor Jacob Reed, Man Enough is a sincere attempt to win votes for Kamala Harris. It was made for Creatives for Harris and reposted by Vote Save America. Unless Reed's entire career is performance art, which I can't rule out, it's both the most self-sabotaging political messaging campaign <laughs> ever and a devastating satire of the progressive unman archetype that could have been titled, Sorry, I Have One. <laughs> <laughs> we'll win the election for Donald Trump if enough men or women for that matter see it <laughs> and the well, best part about this yeah go ahead, no man. go ahead no no go ahead the best part of this is once again these were not actual voters these were actors they hired and yeah. and not good actors either not, yeah. the, not the good actors <laughs> Well, you He's remember remember him. from the Obama campaign. Remember Pajama Boy? Yes, that's exactly what this is, Pajama Boy. Except, honestly, it's even it's even the the, the stereotype is even more ridiculous in this case. Maybe, maybe I mean, Pajama was Pajama Boy Hillary, or was it Obama? I thought it. Well, I either kind of way, it, I'm kind of thinking it was Obama's 2012 campaign. Pajama yeah. Boy. Was. I have to go back and look, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. It's because they're at war with <laughs> masculinity. That's more of an Adam Baldwin well, discussion. Oh yeah. yeah, no, they are. There's no doubt about it. There's no yeah. doubt about it. Toxic masculinity. As opposed well, to pre as opposed to premature jocularity. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, if you suffer from premature jocularity, <laughs> be sure to <laughs> be sure to uh Consult the uh, the our advertisers. I'm sure are going to be flocking to this podcast after this. We've we've set the table <laughs> for premature jocularity. Speaking of premature jocularity, though, that brings us to the jokes of the week. I'm not sure if you've got a joke. I of got the I got none. I got none. I got I've got sincere Thanksgiving wishes 
for all my Canadian relatives and followers. Today is uh, that we're taping on Monday is Canadian Thanksgiving, and uh, I had turkey. So there you go. I'm, I'm in. Yeah, you're in. You're all in. Well, happy thing. Happy Canadian Thanksgiving to all of our uh, viewers in Canada, and happy to you as well. Um, it's also uh, a Jewish holiday today. I don't know if you're aware of it. Columbus. Uh, <laughs> did, you see, did you see the news that they did a DNA analysis of Christopher Columbus's remains, and it turns out he's a Sephardic Jew? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I I contacted Jeff Dennett and I said, "All right, on behalf of the Italians, I have to ask you, what holiday are you willing to swap with us to take over Columbus?" <laughs> <laughs> He hasn't gotten back to me on that, but I'm going to I'm going to get uh, to, to negotiate this. Jeff, of course, is you know not also at lidblog.com. It's a great blog. Go over there and read it. But he's also a member of the Zionist Congress. So I, I I'm I'm assuming I'm talking to somebody with the authority to you know to, <laughs> to give you the, the Italians the want something. Maybe it's the Feast of Booths. I don't know. It's something. We got to have something. Though. We got to yeah, get something. Like mermaids. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. I got a couple jokes for you though. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, a police officer in a small town stops a motorist speeding down Main Street. And the officer walks up and the driver says, look, officer, I can explain. And he says, just be quiet. I'm going to let you cool your heels in jail for this until the chief gets back. He says, but officer, I need to tell you something. He says, I said, keep quiet. You're going to jail. So he arrests the guy, puts him in the thing. And after a few hours, the, the officer comes back in and says, look, I'm going to let you out now. And it's lucky for you that the chief uh, is going to be in a good mood. He's at his daughter's wedding. And the guy says, don't count on it. I'm the groom. <laughs> <laughs> Get me to the church. Yeah, I, like, I love that. I love ones that you don't see coming. Those are the funniest. Well, Speaking of premature jocularity, this is the this is my my last one. Both of these are from jokesoftheday.net, by the way. Jim was startled to see the nonchalant way that his friend John was taking the fact that his his woman was uh, out with another man. And he says, you know, you say you love her, and yet you saw her with another man. You didn't, like, knock the guy down or challenge him? And John says, well, I'm waiting. Jim says, waiting for what? John says, waiting to catch her with a smaller man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Oh, uh, premature jocularity I, actually this is right on time jocularity so there you go it's if things are improving already because of our new sponsors who am, whomever they may be uh, <laughs> all right well one thing that you can count on is lots of on-time jocularity from Andrew Malcolm, the prince of Twitter, the regent of redstate.com. You can follow him on Twitter at A.H. Malcolm. Uh, until next week, I'm I'm back, baby. So we're going to do this again yeah, next week, right? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. All right. We'll talk then. 